Hey, it's Dr. Astar Bear with uh, part three of my series on the economic history and development of China. So again, if there's four phases of, of modern Chinese economic history, uh, the, the imperial period, the Qing dynasty and so forth, the warlord civil war period, uh, the Maoist ch uh, period in China, uh, uh, my previous slideshows have examined that. So this one's going to focus on the reforms uh, of 1978. Uh, to the present. So in this presentation, I'm using the concept of class from the Marxian tradition to understand China's history and development. And just to, to briefly review that, uh, we're constructing five fundamental class processes, okay? We, we are conceiving of these class processes of taking place at the point of production. So there are many different class processes going on in a society. Uh, especially a large, complex one like China. Uh, so, and these are the kind of boundaries of these different class processes. We have the feudal fundamental class process, the slave fundamental class process, and the capitalist fundamental class process. These are all forms uh, of production which involve uh, the workers producing uh, surplus and someone else taking that surplus, either the feudal lord, in the, in the case of this one, or the, the slave master, or the capitalist employer. Uh, and there's different elements of what we call a non-class structure, which separate these. Uh, I go into this in detail uh, in, in another lecture. Uh, then there are non-exploitative uh, class processes, that is, class processes that don't involve someone else taking the surplus. Uh, one of these is called the ancient fundamental class process, also called independent commodity production, or sometimes the petty bourgeois uh, class process or mode of production. Uh, and then there is the communal fundamental class process, uh, which involves the workers collectively producing and appropriating uh, their own surplus. So Marxism, of course, has a very strong commitment to minimizing and eventually abolishing exploitation. Uh, from society altogether, seen as a kind of socialized theft and something that we'd like to move beyond. Uh, and so examining the class structure of a society means considering what are the different forms, uh, different class processes that, that exist in society? How are they, how are they changing? Uh, you know, this is a, a sophisticated and nuanced form of, of class analysis. Uh, and that's that's why I use it. Okay, so in terms of the timeline of events here, Mao passes away in 1976, and that leads to a power struggle for succession, uh, a debate uh, within the CPC over Mao's legacy, and more importantly, the direction of economic policy and development. Um, so, for example, how rapidly does the country progress toward the social and cultural changes needed to transform society versus how much does it prioritize things like economic growth. Now, these uh, have always been uh, major issues in, in China, uh, even under Mao. Uh, but, of course, after, after Mao's leadership is, is removed, uh, the discourse shifts to a different focus. Uh, Deng Xiaoping uh, emerges as the leader of the CPC, and this marks a shift towards a much more prog pragmatic, uh, much more reformist type of approach that focuses much more on economic growth and living standards and much less on the utopian goals of socialism, uh, you know, as articulated during the Cultural Revolution or the kind of grand revolutionary, uh, you know, societal changes uh, that we associate with Mao. Um, now, to explain this shift in policy, um, the CPC changes its rhetoric and it begins to blame Mao for mistakes made during the Great Leap Forward and Cultural Revolution. And part of this narrative uh, attributes 16 and a half million deaths to Mao during the famine of 1959 and 1961 uh, and with no real evidence. Now, I mention this because it's it's, first of all, very new and signals a kind of a new openness to, to say that, uh, you know, oh, the regime made mistakes and so forth. And in some ways that's positive, but to, to kind of see it as necessary to, to throw Mao under the bus, so to speak, uh, 
in order to to change policy uh, and also to to uh, to give critics of China such uh, strong ammunition uh, against socialism is, I think, problematic. So Deng was a member of the CPC from a young age uh, and contributed a lot to the revolution. He, he fought alongside Mao in a long march, uh, but he had been denounced and purged by Mao for being rightist, meaning that you know he was a believer in more uh, market-based uh, approach to socialism than Mao favored. Uh, he, uh, you know, was was uh, sent to the hinterlands and so on, and um, and he was able to return uh, and and actually take power uh, uh, after Mao dies. So he, he's able to institute a set of reforms uh, beginning in 1978 that transforms China, uh, and for this reason, he's often called the architect of modern China. Deng creates the phrase "socialism with Chinese characteristics" that explains the shift in policies uh, and becomes a way to reconcile the, the vast social changes that are involved with these reforms uh, with the legacy of Mao, which is still very important. And Mao is, you know, an immensely popular figure uh, in China to this day. So you cannot really totally discard Mao uh, in China. Um, but Deng gives, you know, the, the goals and the kind of focus uh, of Chinese policy, uh, Deng creates a kind of new interpretation, even of, of Marxist-Leninist thought, um, sometimes called Deng Xiaoping thought. Um, I personally think this is a little bit overblown, uh, you know, that, that there are, I personally don't think that it, an, each new leader, uh, that their interpretation of uh, Marxism or Marxist-Leninism or whatever uh, demands an entirely new uh, name for for the uh, the theory, but in any way, here's a timeline of of some of these market based reforms that occur. Uh, so, 1972, uh, Nixon visits China, which signals new openness uh, to China from the West, and particularly from the United States. Which, you know, the just the, the next item on the timeline here, 1978. The U.S. announces that it will formally recognize uh, the People's Republic of China as the official government of China uh, and sever ties with the, what's called the Republic of China. The, 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 they consider themselves the legitimate uh, government uh, of China, but, you know, in exile in Taiwan. Um, so the, the United States had, had refused to, to recognize uh, the PRC uh, for decades up to this point, right? Um, and had you know sold arms to uh, these uh, you know what the PRC considers a uh, you know a rebellious group right um, so that's a that's a pretty unfriendly kind of stance to take right um, which of course is a product of the Cold War so the the Nixon visit to China and then the formal recognition uh, is a really big deal in terms of. Uh, a change, and it's you know it's related to these reforms, right? It's it's related to a less militant uh, kind of version of socialism in China um, under Deng. So in, in 1978, then we have uh, Deng's open door policy, which allows foreign investment in these these special economic zones. More on that in a bit. Uh, then from 1978 to 1985, uh, agriculture is decollectivized, and uh, these new forms are created called township village enterprises. And then in, from 1984 to 1993, state control is decentralized, move, and it moves to uh, a, a greater focus of it moves to the regional level or the local level. Um, in 1990, uh, Deng reopens the Shanghai Stock Exchange, and you know, for, for better or worse, stock exchanges are, are really seen as a, a tremendous symbol of capitalism. Um, and, you know, that I think that's the case in China as well. Um, so, you know, it's it says, well, we are going to still have socialism, but, but introduce some, you know, things that really represent capitalism here, right? Um, 
Uh, and then in the late 90s, uh, 97, 98, we have the privatization of a lot of state enterprises. Uh, their assets are sold to private investors. Um, and this is, you know, very much part of uh, an entire movement of privatization that's occurring uh, in the capitalist world as well. Uh, you know, many capitalist nations have some state industries, maybe they have a few, um, or state uh, state agencies even sometimes are privatized uh, during this period. So um, then from 2001 to 2004, we have uh, the reduction of tariffs and trade barriers and other regulations that are all part of China joining the WTO, the World Trade Organization. Uh, so as part of the reform, state authorities decentralized, as I mentioned, uh, and these la the large-scale agricultural communes of the Maoist era are transformed into these TVEs uh, with the local uh, state authorities appropriating a surplus. So in 1978, uh, there are 1.5 million TVEs employing 28 million and producing uh, 49 billion uh, renminbi's worth of uh, basic industrial goods, such as iron, steel, cement, chemical fertilizer, and farm tools. Again, this is part of the, the focus uh, of China uh, during the Maoist period to create uh, a solid uh, base for industrialization. So to, to, to manufacture a solid amount of the, you know, the, the basic things that you need in order to further develop manufacturing. Um, by 1985, there were 12 million uh, TVEs, by, and they, by 1992, they produced 1.8 trillion uh, renminbi's worth of output. Uh, by 96, employment in, in TVEs peaked at 135 million. So you can see there's a tremendous growth here uh, in you know less than two decades in terms of employment. Um, now, that, at that point, the TVEs were then dismantled uh, from 89 to 96 uh, during this period of privatization that was often corrupt uh, with, with local officials seizing assets or, you know, using their, their uh, power to buy them at artificially low prices, uh, a process which is in some ways similar to what happens uh, in the former Soviet Union. So uh, the difference, of course, is that the central state has not been overturned. This is just, you know, part of the of the reform effort. Okay, so the central state in China did not privatize all industry, all right, it, in, and it did not decentralize all industry to the local level either, um, especially at what is often called the commanding heights uh, of the economy, uh, enterprises which are seen as key uh, to the development of the economy and, and in terms of the state maintaining control over these key sectors, all right? So, uh, and these are finance, uh, power, energy, telecommunications, wep weapons manufacturing, uh, to list a couple of examples. Some of these were decentralized, uh, but about a hundred of these uh, SOEs remain centrally administered, uh, and the assets uh, of the SOEs have increased substantially, actually, uh, reaching 72 trillion renminbi uh, in, in 2017. Uh, and these SOEs received most of the loans in China, uh, 60% in 2013, uh, in a peak of 78% in 2016. So, you know, the, the state is still heavily involved uh, with a good portion of the economy. Just, just how large is it? Um, well, it's about 50% of China's non-agricultural GDP in, in 2011 was produced by these SOEs. So, you know, very, very important uh, part of the economy, right? All right, so how do we uh, understand what is happening in terms of the, the market for labor power? Okay, so again, we, we made this argument in the previous presentation that during the Maoist period, there was no market for labor power, right? That is, a, a person could not freely sell their labor power to who, whatever employer wish to buy it, and this is one of the one of the key aspects of of private capitalism, right? Um, there, there, all of this was carefully controlled by the state, uh, and the way this was done is each worker was assigned to a work unit, uh, a danwei, which monitored and controlled many aspects of life, uh, delivering services, controlling mobility, monitoring compliance with state policies. 
and the worker was simply bound to this unit, right? The, the workers had permanent employment, uh, and they had a bundle of consumption uh, that's called the iron rice bowl. But in exchange for that, there's a lot of limitations, uh, including this prevention of, of migration and prevention of, of selling uh, your own labor power. Now, Deng ended this system with a set of reforms. So uh, as it's sometimes put in the literature, Deng smashed the iron rice bowl. Right? He ended permanent employment. He ended the guaranteed consumption that went along with the iron rice bowl uh, and also created a market for labor power. So that's a pretty big change. Now, as a result of lifting the, uh, the restrictions on migration, migration increases, right? And migrants from rural areas often face discrimination. Um, this discrimination is, I think, different in character. You know, in the United States, we, we're familiar with racial discrimination. That's a huge part of US history. Uh, it seems to have a different character in, in China, but there, you know, there is, there is discrimination. Um, you know, we see, for example, uh, resentment uh, against migrants from the rural areas uh, and signs up that say, you know, jobs are for Beijing residents only and so on, or, you know, looking down on, on these, these rural peasants and so forth in, in urban areas. Um, so, you know, this is, I think, part of the tension that exists in many societies between the, the rural areas and the urban areas. Uh, which, as they are brought into more contact through this migration, uh, you know, some of these tensions escalate, uh, especially because there's all of these changes going on, right? So the rural to urban migration is somewhere between five to six million people per year. Um, and that's a, that's a pretty big shift, right? So here's a quote on this. In the 30 years since 1979, China's urban population has grown by about 440 million uh, to 622 million in 2009. Of the 440 million increase, about 340 million was attributable to net migration and urban reclassification. Even if only half that increase was migration, the volume of rural to urban migration in such a short period is likely the largest in human history. So that's remarkable, right? Uh, now, rural to urban migration is a fact of every industrialization effort, right? That, that happens everywhere uh, in the history of industrialization. So this is something that China had actually foreseen and, and took steps to try to limit, right? That's, that's, I mean, that's the reason why they adopted these controls uh, in the first place. So here's a map which shows the special economic zones, which is you know, the beginning of the, of the reform process, right? At first, the reforms which allow private capitalist firms to invest in China are limited to certain very small areas. Uh, and they're areas that had been, you know, associated with, with trade in the past and so on. Um, these, these SEZs still exist. Uh, they still continue to attract foreign investment. They focus on production for export. Uh, but of course, a lot of restrictions have been lifted since then. Here's a, a figure which shows uh, the industrial output by foreign invested firms in China as a share of national output in total, okay, going from 1990 to 2011, uh, so just over 20 years here. And we can see that, you know, the in the beginning of this period, the, the f industrial output is at a very low level, right? So, you know maybe about 2% of the total, but it rises pretty swiftly, right? So, you know, in just over, you know, 10 years later, uh, we have over a third of the economy here is, is generated by these foreign firms. So that's a very rapid development, and it brings with it a lot of changes, right? Now, that starts to kind of decline subsequently. Uh, and again, since this is a relative measure, right? We, the, the, the axis over here is uh, the percent of the total, right? So, you know, when we're talking about the percent of a total, there's several ways things can decline, right? The, the, the rest of the economy can grow faster, right? That, which, is, which is what happened here, okay? So it's not that we saw fewer firms investing in China. It's just that uh, 
the overall economy, uh, you know, the, the, the local part of the economy, that is the domestic economy, grew fast. Okay, so the move from the state-owned uh, form of capitalism to the private kind in, in China follows a familiar pattern uh, to the development of capitalism pretty much everywhere else, okay? So that is wages fall, uh, and they often fall to a barely adequate level in many places. There are minimum wage laws in China, uh, but there's often the issue with minimum wage laws, which is that they do not keep pace with rapid cost of living increases. Um, now, the length of the work day and the work week increase dramatically, just as Marx describes uh, in a capital, uh, you know, back in the 1860s, right? So um, we also see the rise of workers being charged for all kinds of offenses, many of them increasing, I mean, to call these offenses is kind of offensive, but uh, including things like, you know, lateness, uh, talking, laughing, loitering outside uh, work hours, uh, production mistakes or failure to make quotas. Um, so that's an unpleasant development. Um, now, employers sometimes provide food for workers as part of the employment contract, uh, but the food that they provide now diminishes in, in quality. It's often stale, moldy, or spoiled. Workplace injuries increase. Uh, the protections that there are in the workplace from hazardous conditions are often non-existent or, or not significant enough. Um, and some successful capitalist owners accumulate large fortunes. So here's an example, right, here's a quote that just indicates some of this process, okay? In a, in a factory in Ningbo City, 30 workers in the space of one year had their fingers, hands, or arms chopped off. The factory had drawn up a compensation price list uh, for death or both hands chopped off. You got uh, 15,000 uh, uh, RMB, that's about $1,600. Uh, so if, if you lost a thumb, you got 3000 If you lost a, one little finger, you got $750. Um, in a cutlery factory in Xiamen uh, that employs 600 workers, 142 workers were maimed over a period of four years. Um, so, and, you know, this is a, a, not directly related to this, uh, this image here, but this is, this is a... a a, uh, a fellow who live streams, he's missing an arm, uh, and he live streams his, his um, you know, manual labor. Uh, and I think there's, there's something that's kind of emblematic uh, about this that, that I think shows both the, uh, the human cost here, but also the kind of resilience uh, and the use of, of technology to kind of uh, share this, right, uh, and it's just interesting. I think it, it shows some of the contradictions of, uh, you know, rapid uh, development of capitalism in China. So let's look at some of these, the results, okay, the, the macroeconomic results of, of these reforms in China. So, of course, our, you know, most often used statistic here would be GDP. Um, and what we can see here is that the, the overall macro policies uh, were very successful. In, in rapidly growing the economy, uh, which again, there's a shift here toward that as a major goal. Th this is a, a very strongly exponential growth path, right? And the total results of it are over 5,000% uh, total economic growth, right? So, so what does this mean? It means that the economy of China is 49 times larger than it, than it was in 1979, right? That's incredible. Um, and this is a, an average annual real growth rate uh, of nearly 11% per year. Now, part of China's economic growth is driven by the growth of exports. And, and this is, uh, you know, one of the most kind of dramatic and noticeable uh, aspects here, right? So during the Maoist period, uh, the economy was basically closed, right? And, and exports were not a factor. Uh, imports were quite limited. Um, so... You know that's very very different, right? Now, now that the in, during this period, right, the total export growth uh, is massive, right? So two thousand five hundred eighty-five percent just from the early nineties. So that's an average growth in terms of exports year over year of fourteen point seven percent. That's remarkably fast export growth. Now trade is very carefully controlled uh, by state policies. Uh, there's a huge focus on obtaining the necessary technology and inputs uh, 
uh, to move up the value chain to more complex forms of manufacturing. So for example, electronics. Um, and this is one thing that in terms of the macroeconomic policies of China that the that the government really focuses on. Now, here's a this chart indicates the the growth of exports and also imports, right? Because there's a balance of trade uh, that that occurs, right? So, you know, because exports and imports tend to be about equal, um, and you know, in China in China they have they have started to diverge, you know, beginning you know in the early 2000s here. And then you know we're seeing a uh, you know a, a large difference between exports and imports, but this is a fairly recent development, right? Um, and China has been able to to use that difference to to accumulate a large uh, sovereign wealth fund, uh, which they are able to use to to help them stabilize the value of their cur their currency and so on. So now part of this the strategy of growing exports uh, is currency depreciation. Which has gotten a lot of focus, uh, you know, in the Western press. Um, it's a double-edged sword uh, because you know it, currency depreciation means that the the value of the currency falls relative to other currencies, uh, and you know this makes the prices of China's export goods uh, more attractive on global markets. Uh, but it also makes the prices of imports rise, right? And remember, imports are necessary in order to again, to move up that value chain. So as the economy shifts towards greater value-added manufacturing, incomes rise, some appreciation uh, of the renminbi is allowed. Um, so just a note on China's currency, uh, the official term for it is, is the renminbi, the RMB. Uh, the unofficial term for it is the yuan. So both of those are used, uh, you know, you see kind of that goes back and forth. Right? I guess yuan is kind of slang, but the RMB is like the official symbol. So again, part of this strategy, you know, moving from the from the reform, the early reform period uh, into the, the kind of mid '90s, is uh, about an eighty three percent appreciation uh, of the of the RMB, right? So, um, you know, the, this again, it makes Chinese exports a lot cheaper. Then we have a, a period of stability, right? So. Um, for about 10 years, the, the value remains very, very stable. And uh, then we have some appreciation, okay? So this is this is 18.6 appreciation. This makes uh, Chinese exports a bit more expensive. Um, but at this point, the export market is pretty well developed, although it, grow, it grows considerably even during this period. All right, so again, I mentioned this moving up of the value chain. Um, and electronics is one of these high value and high complexity uh, kinds of you know manufacturing, right? And and China has actually emerged uh, as the the top uh, exporter of of consumer electronics. So that's interesting, right? That's a very new development. Um, they produce a lot of smartphones, right? Smartphone production has risen substantially. Uh, you know, just during this five year period, we we go from you know about you know about 250 million units to just about 900 million so that's a remarkably fast development um, and again we can see the the use of of this in terms of the trade policy right to to import advanced technology so uh, the the growth just in three years here from 2016 to 2019 uh, in robotics uh, imports in China pretty substantial right so Again, the strategy is uh, through heavy state involvement in, in trade uh, and state direction of, of the economic development to, to move up the value chain into the highest value kinds of manufacturing. Now let's look at the question of how did the class structure of China change uh, in the wake of these post-1978 reforms? So in terms of agriculture, right, the, under Maoist uh, China, and the argument is we have a feudal fundamental class process, uh, and I'm following the work of, of Gabriel here, uh, that, that farmers perform necessary and surplus labor, they deliver that product to the state, and they get state-supported consumption, that is the iron rice bowl. They have permanent employment, but they can't leave the farm. So as agriculture is decollectivized, the iron rice bowl is ended, 
and a market for labor power is created, uh, there's a shift towards farmers now being able to tend their private plots and own the products. I mean, this is this is actually true before as well, but they're still responsible for, for meeting their quotas. But all of these things shift uh, agriculture substantially. They, they, they move it into a combined ancient fundamental class process that is the individual production appropriation of their own surplus. Uh, you know, they have to meet their state quota but can sell any excess. But also a capitalist fundamental class process. So some of these farms become state capitalist enterprises, that is TVEs. Others become private capitalist firms. So, you know, there there are some differences between whether this is a state-owned or private form of capitalism, but for the purposes of this, right, the, the shift is clear, right? So we move from a, the feudal fundamental class process, but a unique form of it. Okay, again, I discussed that uh, in my previous lecture, um, to a, a combination of the ancient and, and capitalist fundamental class process in agriculture. What about manufacturing? Well, again, we have a situation uh, prior to these reforms where the state owns all the means of production, they hire workers to receive a wage, but again, well, they also get permanent employment and so forth, but there's no market for labor power, right? This is, again, indicative of the limitations here, uh, the being assigned to a work unit and so forth. What do you call that when you 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 cannot participate in one of these essential defining features of capitalism, which is, you know, that there's a market for labor power, right? That does not exist during this period. So the reforms, right, they allow private capitalism that both from, from outside investment and also due to privatization within the economy, uh, they also create a market for labor power and end uh, the end the guarantees, right? They end the guarantees of employment and so forth. Um, now, the state also keeps a hand in production, right? They produce through the TVEs and through the SOEs. So the state has significant involvement in the economy still, and they also engage in economic planning. Um, you know, these are, again, seen as key elements of socialism, um, but they allow more market prices. So you know, how do we understand this from, from a perspective of class, right? Well, this is a, a transformation that takes us from the feudal, state feudal, really, fundamental class process, right? That is, it's feudal, but not with private lords being the appropriator, right? As the state, the state is the appropriator here. So the shift is from, from this, right, to a state capitalist fundamental class process combined now with a private capitalist fundamental class process. So we have a mixture of these different capitalist class processes here in the post-78 period. So how do we characterize this whole thing right now? Based on its class structure, China cannot be called communist, okay? The, the communal fundamental class process is at most marginal in the Chinese economy. Um, so again, how, this goes back to like, how do we define, well, what is communism, right? And I have an entire lecture on this uh, which looks at the, the various different ways that, that communism is defined and understood in the Marxist tradition. Um, so uh, again, you know, typically you would define a, a society as communist if it has abolished exploitation and moved into a, a stateless, classless form. Now, obviously, no society uh, on earth has done that, right? I mean, maybe in the distant past, but certainly no modern society uh, has done that. So it's an aspiration, right? Um, China, uh, you know, they, 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 they say they have the Communist Party, but they do not actually claim, right? There's no, no, no serious intellectual, no member of the CPC claims that China is communist, right? That, that is a an invention of the West, uh, you know, it's it's an aspiration, right? Now, okay, let's let's answer another question, right? Is China socialist? Um, well, here there's a lot of debate and disagreement because the term socialist is not very well defined, right? Um, you know, it suggests that there's a, a, a it's a bridge state, it's a transitionary state um, toward communism and away from the exploitative class structures of the past, but you know, it, it suggests that there's an intention to transition to communism in the future. Um, 
you know, Gabriel argues that, uh, that China has made a transition from state feudalism in the Mao's period to state capitalism with the post-1978 reforms. And, you know, again, that's the argument that I just went over. The problem with this as a definition is it's hard to gauge intentionality. Now, to label China state capitalist uh, or a mixture of state and private capitalist uh, does not imply that it is similar to other forms of capitalism. Uh, it's really not. Um, so in many ways, China is unique. Though China struggles with the traditional problems of capitalism, so that is class struggle, very much still present, falling wages, poor work conditions, inequality, again, all of the problems of capitalism that we have seen over capitalism's 300 or so year history, uh, the country has successfully lifted hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. They, they have uh, a really uh, massive and amazing record of success with regard to, to social welfare. Um, and, you know, in such a short period of time, right, this is really unprecedented in the history of capitalism. So, you know, if we, if we want to use the term state capitalist to, to describe China, we have to acknowledge that what it's doing is very, very different from other forms of capitalism that we've seen historically. Uh, I mean, really, like night and day. Uh, even though it's it's clearly, right, again, has a lot of the same traditional problems. So one could argue that China is socialist in terms of following a national economic policy that's designed to benefit the masses of people. Uh, but in terms of eliminating exploitation, right, that's clearly not occurred. Uh, and in many ways, the reforms of 1978 have moved the country away from that goal, right? Um, now, debates on this issue rage among Marxists uh, in China and elsewhere in the world because socialism is still relatively new historically, right? Uh, as, as a concept, as a goal, as, as an explicit policy of the state, um, very, very new. Uh, so, you know, that plays a role here uh, in... in you know, how do we understand what is happening here? Um, there's a lot of like conflict where, where does where does theory meet reality, right? Now, much of the discourse on socialism and capitalism is trapped in what Marxists call idealism, right? That is constructing an abstract, idealized form of a mode of production like capitalism, like socialism, right? And arguing that it has essentialized characteristics. So capitalism is this, which, of course, overlooks the many different forms of capitalism that have existed in different countries and, again, throughout its several hundred year uh, period of history. And the same could be said of socialism right there. There is not one idealized abstract form of socialism, right? And, and it's very unhelpful to proceed on that basis. But a lot of the discourse is trapped in that. So you see a lot of people saying, well, capitalism is inherently this, that, or the other thing. Socialism is inherently this. That's a very problematic way to conduct discourse. So the socialism with Chinese characteristics, uh, as, as Deng calls it, right, or, or if you prefer, the mixture of state and private capitalism with significant focus on social welfare and state planning, I know that's not as, uh, that's not as elegant a phrase, <laughs> a lot longer phrase, right, um, that exists should be considered an experiment uh, in creating socialism, right? It's not a pure and eternal form um, and it's not necessarily a model that all countries should emulate either, right? I mean, that's, again, that falls into the problems of essentializing and idealizing, you know, a, a particular country's experiment, right? Uh, socialism must always be adapted uh, to local conditions. It has to consider the history, the context, the phase of economic and social development of a country like China has done, right? China has done that. So, you know, I, it doesn't personally doesn't interest me all that much in, you know, labeling something as oh it's this or it's that, right? That that runs the risk, as I've said, of essentializing and and flattening the discourse to a level that's really not helpful, right? Um, if the goal is to create a society uh, that is free of exploitation, there may be a lot of things that have to be done before that occurs, right? Um, you know, the, the country might need to be industrialized, right? The country might need to protect itself against its enemies, right? It might need to, uh, might de it might need to engage in a significant amount of exploitation in order to get to that point. 
that's a possibility that, you know, it's, it's a contradiction. But to, to think that socialism is going to immediately result in a kind of paradise or utopia uh, is just extremely naive, right? That's, that's, not, uh, that's not consistent with how societies ever change and develop, right? Okay, so that's my lecture. Thank you so much.